Good afternoon and welcome to the first in a new series here on Racing TV, My Racing Life, where we learn a little bit more about selected racing personalities, the races which have rather shaped their life and also the love of the horse, the love of punting, uh, the love of horse racing in general. Uh, over the next hour we will be learning about uh, the person who I'm about to introduce and is a man who has uh, made punting on horses his primary occupation since the mid-1980s, uh, formerly the Morning Mole in the racing and football outlook. A keen golfer, a massive Tottenham Hotspur fan and a man who's been broadcasting his thoughts on horse racing since the turn of the century. It is, of course, and the man in the screen, Steve Mellish. Good afternoon to you. Uh, Steve, how about that for an introduction? Was it all accurate? Hugely overplayed, <laughs> but, but, I'll, but I'll take it. Um, obviously, the, we are set against the context, the fact that we are not broadcasting live racing at the moment. So we're looking back and we've asked you to, to take a look back at, at your life in racing, which obviously goes under a, an, under a number of decades now. Um, how difficult was it to look back and pick out so many different thoughts or so few different thoughts across so many different years, Steve? That's a good question. I... I found it difficult. It's like, it's like if you chose your seven favourite records or whatever it is, I reckon you'd always have three or four which would always be in the list. And of the seven we've got here, that's certainly the case. Whatever time of the day, however I was feeling, I'd always have it in. The other three, I probably could have chosen another ten. And in the end, I, I decided the criteria was something that... one that meant something to me. And I tried to, other than in one case... It's really not betting related. It's to do with why a horse, I don't know, moved me for uh, for other reasons. You know, some some relevance they had. So I thought it'd be more interesting um, to have those sort of horses rather than you know, I back this and won this, and I back this and win that. That's you know, that's pretty tedious and pretty boring after a while. So I've tried to choose horses, and there's a relevance which we'll discuss each time uh, we mention the horse. And because when we go through it, the, the seven horses that you've picked out, as well as a legendary jockey, we're, we're spanning a number of decades from the 1970s through to through to the present day almost or certainly the last decade did it did it stir up a load of emotion or nostalgia when you were going through yeah I felt really guilty about leaving horses out <laughs> uh, to be honest there's horses who really meant a lot to me and that's uh, um, if you have a guilt trip it was about that I thought well, how have I not got that in but anyway you know if we ever did it another day in a, in a, in a alternative world I'm sure I'd have three or four different ones so yeah, it did stir up emotion most of them were very pleasant because Obviously, all of these are horses who gave me a great deal of joy. Let's talk about you a bit more, because obviously a lot of people will know you for this very role on the screen. Many people in racing will have had you as a colleague or certainly someone they've seen on, on the race course for a number of years now. But when did it all come about for you? When did you think racing was everything you wanted to do? In fact, actually, how early on in your life was it that horse racing really came onto your radar? Well, really early racing was a passion. Um, my first bet I can ever, ever remember having, I might have had one before, was in the 1963 National. Mm. And the reason I mention it is that after that, I really did spend a lot of time, um, I think it's seven or eight, reading, um, you know, reading articles about racing. And I, 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 I knew a lot about you know, the history of the Derby by the times I was eight. For example, just give you a, a boring fact, I remember vividly, and I would have been at junior school, I think I would have been seven or eight, I remember spending the afternoon wondering whether Scobie Breezley was going to win the derby on Santa Claus. Because at that stage, um, he was my favourite jockey and I was hoping he'd win. I was much more interested in that than the maths or something that was going on. So it was, it was yeah, it's been a significant part of my life, a passion, I'd say, for however many years that is, 55 years. Was that something you could share with your school friends or were you unique? 55, that's good. Uh, I had no school friend at all that uh, I can remember. When I got to senior school, there was a person who was I'm quite friendly with, who I went racing with a couple of times. But no, no one like that. And I quite like that about it. I'm I'm quite an antisocial person in lots of ways. So I like the solitude of it and forming my own views. And I actually quite enjoy going racing. In the old days, I mainly went racing by myself. In the twenty odd years where I was I was you know going racing four times a week invariably be by myself and uh, you know, I enjoyed that. And what did you think you liked most about it, to pinpoint it? Because there's so many different factors, the fact that the maths that's involved, that the, the percentages of being right or very often in my case wrong, um, the human story there, the love of the animal, that there's so many different factors to why people love horse racing. What was it for you? 
I love the history of it, first of all. That's the, as I said earlier, that's what got me involved. I like, on a daily basis, I like the fact that they're puzzles you're trying to work mm. out. And obviously, um, the other thing I like about it is you're wrong more than you're right. I don't care who you are, you're wrong much more than uh, much more than you're right. I think that's quite healthy for you. It stops you getting ahead of yourself, I hope, too much. Uh, it's everything, really. I say I, I think it's a great sport. I think I think sports which have should always keep their history if they can. I think the uh, well, you know I, I know I'm going on about a lot of horses who ran a long time ago here, and I'm not saying they're better than horses running now. They're not mm. clearly, but equally, because something happened 50 years ago, it didn't mean they weren't relevant. You know, so I like all of that. I, mean, I, just, I like the colour of it. I like the atmosphere. I like the characters uh, involved. When I used to go racing, I had a lot of time for on-course bookmakers, for example. Or I, um, I'm not saying they're all lovely people, but I think they added a lot to the sport and uh, that's uh, something which maybe is not quite the same now as it was with the advent of Betfair etc but anyway I, I just I love everything about it I really really enjoy um, both codes I probably I'd probably more into or have historically been more I'd say into flat racing yeah and I quite like the fact that the the, the horses turn over every year and just before we move on to the horses that you've picked, was this something you could share with family, i.e. your father? Was this something, a passion that you could share with, with family? Um, my father thoroughly disapproved of the idea of me trying <laughs> to make a living at this. And in fact, he's involved in the Troy story, which I will tell you in a minute. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I share it with, uh, with my wife. Uh, I won't say she's a, you know, she's not a huge racing fan, but she's been really supportive and really understanding of it. And, you know, she puts me down as barmy and accepts it. it it's, just, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge part of what you are. Right, we will go and uh, delve down memory lane to take a look at the first of Steve's magnificent seven. And the first of them comes up in 1979, Troy winning the derby. Let's remind ourselves of that great day. Run towards the outer, then comes Dickens Hill. And so they've got about two and a half hours on to go. Night Path, which continues to make it. And then make it run on the outside is, is Dickens Hill. Then also just in behind them, Milford. But they still have about a run on a half deal to go. And it's Dickens Hill and Troy now comes there. And it's Troy now comes sweeping through to take up the running. And so they come now towards the final furlong. It's Troy and Willie Carson in the lead. Going away from Dickens Hill, Northern Baby. Ella Man and Burn, Life at Wish. As they come out towards the line, it's Willie Carson who wins the derby on Troy. Dickens Hill is second. Then comes Northern Baby, Ella Man and Moon. Life Fast which hard green man of vision and so Willie Carson was thoroughly vindicated in opting for number 24 Troy he had the choice of Troy or Milford so Troy the winner of the 1979 derby the 200th derby uh, trained by Major Dick Hearn and of course ridden by Willie Carson who I think described him as the best colt at the time that that he'd ridden but this was your first selection as we go chronologically Steve why Troy OK, I've already told you that from 64 onwards, I was reading and reading about the Derby and I absolutely loved it, loved you know, all the history involved. And on television, you know, I saw uh, Survivor winning in great style and Nijinsky winning and would Mill Reef stay? Yes, he would. Would Grundy stay? Yes, he would. But to my shame, I got to the age of 23 and I'd never been live. I'd been to Epsom, but I'd never been live. So I made up my mind then. It was the 200th derby. Uh, I had no particular view of win. I certainly don't think I ever backed Troy in his life, as it happens. But I went there and talk about a day living up to your expectations. But I'll tell you briefly, I mentioned my father earlier, a very brief story. The day nearly went completely wrong. I would say I was 23 and my dad was going that day with my mum and I, was, I, I met him, he used to live in Catford. I went over to Catford to go in the car with him. We left about half nine, it's about a 45 minute journey. And uh, my father was the worst driver in the history of mankind. <laughs> and especially if we didn't really know the way somewhere. He'd always go via somewhere he knew. So he knew something about going down to Brighton and he knew he used to touch Purley. So we made our way to Purley through people who know this, Croydon's High Street and somewhere else is High Street. And anyway, everywhere we get, we miss traffic. We went round the wrong way in a one-way system at Purley. Hours now, we were actually getting to say we thought we weren't going to make it in time. And he was getting more and more and more angry, really angry. And it was it was most uncomfortable. Not helped by my mum, who kept saying things like, are you sure we should have gone this way, Bob, or are we going to make it? Anyway, either way, we couldn't wait to get out of the car. And Liz and I got out of the car about two miles from Epsom and uh, walked the rest of the way. And we just made it before the first. So the day started terrible. But as a day, it lived up to everything. The atmosphere, the crowd, the noise. There was 20-odd runners coming down Tattenham Corner. 
and then obviously we saw a spectacular winner. You know, there's no you couldn't have guaranteed that before, and it was a wide open betting race. But Troy was brilliant that day. He beat he beat Dickens Hill, who won the Eclipse next time out. Northern Baby won the Champion Stakes. It was a really, really, really good performance, and it absolutely vindicated all my dreams of going to the Derby. And I've missed very few Derbies live since. Had you been to Exum, as in the race course before? First track I ever went to. Was it? And yet uh, the Derby was my still... My Uncle Alf, who was a... Mm. Now, in terms of... Well, you just look at the inside there, and obviously the densely packed um, throngs just watching the race and enjoying it as we, we associate with Epsom each and every summer. Um, unfortunately, not in 2020. But what did you first make of it when you got to Derby Day? Were you completely overawed by it? Was the atmosphere everything you imagined? Uh, fantastic and it was a different it was a different derby there even up until the late 80s you had to park a mile and a half away from the place to get there it was very very difficult the roads were packed there was much more people in the infield you had buses or whatever so it was a different race it was on a wednesday um and in those days it was a massively significant sporting event um you, you know in the wider scheme of, of sport i mean so yeah and Whenever you have dreams, it's very easy for them to be disappointed. But as I said, everything about it, bar the journey there, everything about it was uh, perfect. Uh, just, just perfect. And I was buzzing by the time I come home. So that was 1979. How many times have you missed the derby since then? God, I hadn't thought about that. Um, uh, Epsom on derby day, I would imagine I've been every year by about two, maybe three maximum. But is it a race which is sort of... Obviously, it's each and every summer we look forward to it. It is well, it's the, I, the, the greatest test of the thoroughbred. But um, is it a race which rather shapes your year each year? It's the race I look forward to most each year and, you know, spend probably more time in the winter thinking about who might win uh, a derby. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it, it, there was a time in the sort of the, probably the 60s and 70s where it was by a mile the most important race mm. in, uh, in Britain, probably in Europe. I'm not sure that's the case now, if we're being honest, uh, but it's still an extremely relevant race, and you can tell that by how seriously Coolmore still take it. You know, it's still their most important race of the year, uh, and I think it's a great place to have it. It's a very difficult racetrack. It tests everything you can about thoroughbred. It's a much stiffer track than people give it credit for. Very stiff mile and a half. It tests balance. It tests temperament with all the crowds. And I think it's uh, you wouldn't, you know, if you design the Derby now, maybe you wouldn't have it there. But I think that'd be a big mistake. I think Epsom's a, a wonderful place on Derby Day. And to talk about that first race and delve a little bit deeper with it, obviously plenty know about Willie Carson, the trainer, Major Dick Kern, but, but he passed away, I think, in 2002. And at the end of it all, he had three times the Derby winner. He, had, uh, he was champion trainer four times, 16 classic. Of course, he, a man who fought physical adversity as well. There were some incredible people around as well for that first Derby that you visited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, a, you know, he was he's clearly got a, a great record. And uh, was that Willie Carson's first Derby winner? I think it was. Um, yeah, I, I, they weren't the bit that um, that I remember about the race. He's clearly one of the you know, one of the great trainers of, of, of his era, and he he won it again with Nashwan, yeah. who some people consider a better horse. Not that you know, not that many years later, but uh, they were significant figures. But for me, it was the day, it was the Derby itself that uh, that did it for me right we're going to change codes but the link is the derby because of course this horse as a three-year-old ran in the derby but was still strutting his stuff at cheltenham some oh. years later sea pigeon Oxen round in the home turn now in the champion hurdle and it's Mansfield in the lead from Bird's Nest and Sea Pigeon. Mansfield, Sea Pigeon and Bird's Nest are the three principals as they come to the last. It's Mansfield who's got a touchdown just in the lead from Sea Pigeon. Mansfield and Sea Pigeon, it's a repeat of last year. The same two fighting it out. Sea Pigeon coming there on the near side and Sea Pigeon's going to avenge that defeat of last year. He's striding up to the line, the veteran 10 year old. He's won it at last. Sea Pigeon wins the champion hurdle. Mansfield is beaten for the first time in three years. Bird's Nest is third. Four is Royal Boxer. Five, six and seven are Pollitt's Town. 
Connaught Ranger Norfolk Dance and then come Broadlees and Paiute is last for France and so the result of the 1980 Waterford Crystal Champion Hurdle first number 11 Sea Pigeon owned by Mr. Uh, the first of two wins in the Champion Hurdle for Sea Pigeon 1980 and then 1981 age 10 and 11 but he packed so much in before that it was a monumental career and when you when you picked out your magnificent seven for for this hour Steve was he quite an easy one to put in uh, he'd be my first two every time he or for three every time anyway he, he's for lots of reasons really if in leaving prize money aside because obviously there's one or two horses who earn more money he would be the horse I'd love to have owned in in history I mean what a race horse. He ran in five successive champion hurdles in a vintage era. And it's not just me, uh, my age. Anybody who does ratings and that will have that era of Night Nurse, Monksfield, Sea Pigeon, Bird's Nest, Dramatid, whatever. You know, it was a vintage, vintage period. And he got fourth the first time he tried it, second to Monkfield, looking like the winner going to the last, second to Monkfield again, looking even more like the winner going to the last. Then at the age of 10, he wins. At the age of 11, he wins again. And just to throw in for good measure, why he was so fantastic, he was a brilliant horse on the flat as well. He wasn't mm. so much in his early stage. I know he ran the derby, but he was a bit sort of iffy in his early stages. But he got better with age, and he won an Ebor as a nine-year-old, carrying 10 stone, giving, including with the rider's allowance, £40 to the second. I mean, he was a mighty horse under both codes, and uh, I bow to absolutely no one in my admiration for him. He was a brilliant. He got beat loads of times. He, you know, he didn't want to hit the front too early. That's why he got beat a few times in the Champions Hurdle. He could pull up in front. He did that in the Ebor, nearly lost the race. And he was never, I don't think, quite as effective on the flat in conditions races, even though he had the best horse in the race. He didn't get the pace to run off that he appreciated. But when he got things right, he was absolutely magnificent. And he lasted for so long. So he was, uh, uh, he was, he was anybody who was who's my age who likes horse racing would tip their hat to Sea Pigeon. This is the 1981 champion hurdle. He was defending champion. He'd won it, of course, the year before under John Joe O'Neill, who years later actually said about him, I'm still looking for one like that to train. What a horse he was. This was the day under John Frankham. Uh, we watched this back as we built up uh, to the Cheltenham Festival earlier this year, and it's a joy to watch back, actually, isn't it? The ride, everything about it, the fact that the horse was 11. The confidence of Frankham this day, Steve. Yeah, look, John Joe Real rode in great, and uh, you, you saw him with my seven years the year before. There's something about the quiet style of John Frankham which made it look even better that day. He was absolutely contemptuous of his rivals. He didn't let the horse go till a hundred yards out, and you know he was yeah he was he was great. He, that that was the way to ride him to come late. He didn't want to hit the front too soon, but I say he's 11 then as well. He's 11 years old. He's not like he's uh, he'd be running in veterans races now. What a horse. 37 wins from 85 races as well. And when you, when you called back, and we, we looked at the two champion hurdles, but you also you, you touched on the flat, the fact that there were two Chester Cups, that Ebor when no one saw it. Were you actually there on the day? I think the, the television oh. companies were on strike in 79. Yeah, I was luckily. I thought he got beat because um, a combination of... Uh, John Joe rode it then, I think. Yes. He sort of dropped his hands very late and the horse didn't take much uh, didn't take much encouragement to put himself up and he won by a very, 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 very short head. I think, actually, Peter Easterby, that day, after, after the win just about in the Ebor, he said that it was so close his heart stopped beating. He actually felt that. Um, was he quite a public horse at the time as well, when you look back at it? Was he one that, that everyone enjoyed? Yeah, I think I think loads of people wanted him to win the champion hurdle because what he had, Night Nurse and Monkfield, I don't know, history might show they were actually slightly better hurdlers. Mm. Uh, they probably were. But in every champion hurdle he ran in, he travelled like the best horse in the race. He had a very, very high cruising speed. He'd come there lobbing. Now, Monkfield was probably too tough for him a couple of occasions and Night Nurse as well. But um, uh, I, think the, I think the class he obviously oozed is what attracted people. So this is obviously the second of the, the two horses that you've picked. We've done 1979 Troy and then we've had 80 and 81 with Sea Pigeon. Just give us a flavour of, of where were you, what were you doing at this point in your life, Steve? Cool. In 1982, uh, I'd have been working most winters, doing rubbish jobs and uh, trying to make my living uh, in the summer uh, um, on the flat. That's mainly what I was doing in those days, hence being at York. Define a rubbish job. What were you doing? 
Oh, God. Just a whole series of anything that you could do. I worked at a lot of betting shops, actually. Yeah. And they were fine. I, I quite enjoyed them, but I, uh, I worked at a post office at one stage. I had a job for one day at Dewhurst the Butchers, literally one day. Um, that was the nearest I ever come to hard work, I think. Um, so it, just anything to avoid. Any, in those days, it was, and I'm lucky, it was easier to get jobs, even with a terrible record I had of packing them up. But um, though none of them were of any worth. They just stopped me spending money in the winter and um, you know, maybe, maybe look forward to the summer. And when you were, were you racing the, were you going the lengths and breadths of the, of the country, anywhere where you could go racing, was that where you were drawn to? I say that, that, that kicked in more from about 83 onwards, 84 onwards, certainly. I was going racing a lot, yeah, you know, three or four times a week. And because in those days there was, there was different tax. It was, I think it was, I think it was 4p tax in those days on course, 10p tax off course. I may be, I may be wrong, but I thought I remember it as being. So there was value for going and things weren't on television in the same way. So you had an edge by going and seeing things as well. So after Troy and C. Pigeon, we are going to be returning to the level now and taking a look at one of the great stayers, Ardros. Not a lot between these sextet now as they begin the run down hill towards the half mile pole in the Goodwood Cup. Donegal Prince from Mons Beau, Ardros, Double Florin, Halsbury and Poxy's Joy and just coming to the Four furlong marker now. Donegal Prince from Mons Beau. Ardross. Popsy's Joy coming there quite strongly now towards the outside of Paul Cook as they come down towards the three furlong marker. Halsbury improving over on the far rail. And Ardross coming between Halsbury and Donegal Prince. Mons Beau. Popsy's Joy on the far side. Double flooring not out of it. But Lester Pickett holding a double handful as they race past the two furlong pole. And it's Ardross on the far side. Popsy's Joy on the near side. Between horses Donegal Prince. But Ardross is quickening. And it's Ardross Lester Pickett as they enter the final furlong now. From Donegal Prince and Popsy's Joy. Racing into the closing stages. And Ardross winning very cheekily indeed from Donegal Prince in second and Ardross has won the Goodwood Cup from Donegal Prince Halsbury's third and four pops his joy five double Florin and six and last was Mons Beau and so the result of the uh, so easy so dominant uh, from Ardross and Steve obviously before my time but like you a lover of, of the history of horse racing as well um, and to bring in Lamos as well who we will talk about Ardross versus Lamos and we'll talk about their battles um, they're evocative of a really special era of stayers, aren't they? I think they're very important to what's now been improved lately with staying, with the, the money that's been put into it and, the, and you know, or is being put into it. And the, let's get some context here. This is what's really about Ardross only, if I'm being honest. I only ever backed Ardross once. That's his final race in the arc. It was Ardross, Limos, Cigaro, Buckskin. There were four fabulous stayers around from... I think about in 75, was it the first time that Cigaro won the Gold Cup? Around then, anyway. And it was a, it desperately needed a stay. Stayan was dying. The prize money was rubbish. Um, they were starting to be, all the breeding was aiming at, at the horses over a shorter trip. And these horses, by particularly the year before that, when Ardross and Le Moss were meeting each other, really got the public interest. They were, they had three titanic struggles. They were brilliant horses, good enough to run well over shorter trips. Certainly, um, you know, Ardross was second in an arc, as I say, and uh, a, a really high class horse. But they were absolutely top notch stayers, every bit as good as any stayer you've seen since. And because they were around at the same time, you know, they met each other, or at least, in, say, in the case of uh, Buckskin, Le Moss, and, and Ardross, they had challenges, and they absolutely got people fascinated by staying again. I tell you what, to illustrate that a little bit further, we will have a look at the, the record between them, uh, Le Moss and Ardross. There you are, the Gold Cup at Ascot, first Le Moss, second Ardross, three quarters of a length, Goodwood Cup, uh, Le Moss, Ardross, a neck, Doncaster Cup, Le Moss, second Ardross, a neck. So three quarters of a length, a neck and a neck. That was their rivalry in 1980. There must have been, uh, particularly by Doncaster at the end, there must have been quite an anticipation building, Steve. Yeah, in the last two, Limos was giving two pounds to Ardross, and he was the better horse that year. Now, a few things changed. One, uh, the following year, Ardross won, uh, you know, was, was never beaten, from the next two years, was never, ever beaten again over a trip further than yep. a mile and a half. Two things happened. One, he got older and more mature. Well, three things happened. Uh, two, Limos retired. 
And three, he moved from, um, I think it was Kevin Frederick, who'd yeah. done really well with him, and they brought him along brilliantly. He then joined Henry Cecil, who at that time was uh, had a real special touch with stay, as Ardross, Lemos, Buckskin were all his, and uh, he was utterly dominant. He became, again, a bit like Sea Pigeon. He didn't used to win by far. He used to muck around, and um, he, sometimes he took some driving to get himself interested, and he'd doss a bit at the end. But he was he, he was a different class than the horses for two years over staying trips. Right, I'm going to bring in Sir Henry Cecil because we will be talking about uh, him a little bit later and the fact that uh, we'll be going through the decades to talk about obviously one of the most significant horses who doesn't need much of an introduction. But at that sort of stage, um, how significant was Henry Cecil as he was then to you and, and your love of racing, your punting on racing, effectively your racing life, how significant was Henry Cecil? I mean, he was a, a great trainer. I got to know him in the last mm. five years of his life. I didn't know him before, um, so that, that became different. But as a trainer, he, he and Michael Stout were the dominant British trainers. And, yeah, I mean, his record he speaks for itself. It's, it's fantastic. And he had a special way with, um, uh, with Stayers, definitely. I had a great day with him once when he was talking to me about the training of Stayers. And I can't go into the ins and outs because I haven't got the time. But basically, <laughs> it was all about... Uh, uh, feel. He never used to um, uh, gallop them over more than about uh, six or seven furlongs, but uh, you know he he had a real touch for which horse he would stay. And obviously, in the case of Limos, Limos was really bred to stay. He's, he's related to uh, you know great stayers himself, so yep. there was no surprise. And he'd, his whole career, he looked as though he'd get better and better the further he went. And just with, with Henry Sosa, you said in the final few years of Sir Henry's life, you, you got to know him. Was it a case of... Did you have so many questions you just wanted to ask him, given the years you've, you'd watched of his dominance, the comeback, but also just the fact that you'd had so many years where you'd enjoyed Henry Cecil, later Sir Henry Cecil, did you find yourself wanting to ask him about just about everything going? Yeah, I'm not sure he particularly wanted to um, talk about all... all, all. I just, yeah, I, I went to interview him a couple of times mm. and I was lucky enough to see several of Frankel's gallops. Uh, with him, and they were they were just great. It was a, um, you know, he was very nice to me, and it was they were they were they were they were good times. And obviously, if you you touched on horses, he had st stories to say. But I just thought he was a um, a magnificent trader, and I'm really pleased that Frankel came back at the end of his career to remind the next generation of what a good trainer he was. And lastly, when we conclude the stayers, when when we talk about more recent stayers, obviously Stradivarius at the moment, but going back to Yates. Uh, the Persian punches and double triggers and so on. Do you always find your mind going wistfully back to the, the era of Ardross and Lamos? Well, to say Stradivarius, so I love Stradivarius. Uh, Bjorn Nielsen has been very kind. He had a really good interview with uh, Lydia one day at uh, Newmarket where he was talking about his respect and his admiration for the forces I've mentioned, your cigaros yeah. and... Ardrosses and Lamosh, you know, that's one of the things that got him interested. So, you know, there, there's, there's, he paid sort of you know, due respect to them. Yeah, I suppose I do. Um, I, I thought that I think there was more. I mean, Yates was a great stay. Yates won four gold cups and, you know, maybe he was better. Um, got a statue at Ascot, maybe he was. I actually <laughs> think there was more substance to the, the form of the horses we're mentioning. You know, the second best stayer around when Yates was running was a horse called Septimus, who was trained by the same yard and they never met. And so I suppose I, I, I always hankered back to Ardross and Lamos meeting. Now, they met when they were in different yards, yep. whether that would have been the same the following year. By luck, in the end days, Ardross was trained in Ireland. The three of them gave three titanic uh, struggles together. Well, it's Ardross who made your list, and that was selection number three. Selection number four uh, is from the classic scene of 1984, the very classy Chief Singer. On the left of the picture is Habibti, on the inside of her, just preceding her, is Chief Singer. Yellow Domino, Princess Tracy dispute the lead, from Superlative and Forzando, and then Committed and Gabitat, then behind Gabitat, never so bold, then comes Chief Singer, and last is Habibti, and they're at the halfway stage. You can see Leicester on the extreme left of the picture there, begins to make ground on the outside of Chief Singer. However, Yellow Domino now passed by Princess Tracy, here comes Committed, and uh, Ray Cochran going to weave in between horses, and Leicester's going to commit... Come committed to come on the outside, furlong and a half to go, a wide open race, committed is committed, goes for home from Princess Tracy, a Ray Cochran weaves through between horses, Forzando coming with the run, Habibti on the outside, under pressure and surely beaten inside the final furlong is Chief Singer going on from Never So Bold, Chief Singer Never So Bold coming in, Chief Singer Never So Bold coming in, Chief Singer Never So Bold coming in, Chief Singer is going to win it, Chief Singer the winner, Never So Bold coming in. Committed third, then Forzando, then Princess Tracy. A big disappointment. Habibti beat only three. 
superlative Gabitat. Last of all was Yellow Domino. And so the result of this North Cross... As uh, Chief Singer, the winner of the July Cup in 1984. He had the size, he was almost black to look at, uh, the looks to die for as well, and the story was bang there uh, as well as that. And uh, just for context, how brilliant was Chief Singer? We're going to talk about the way that he was campaigned, the extraordinary start that he had going into the Coventry Stakes on debut. But as a racehorse, how brilliant was he, Steve? Ah, pretty brilliant. I mean, he was unlucky to be born the same year as El Gran Senor, who was one of the great milers. But that's one of the reasons I put, or two reasons I put him in my list. One, uh, I'm going to talk about in a minute, was how versatile he was. I loved the fact of they ran him over, you know, six furlongs a mile and ten furlongs, all in the space of about two months. I mean, phenomenal. Uh, so I love that. I lo and he, he introduced me to, I liked him, I mean, I, obviously I, I saw him win the Coventry and uh, I thought he was magnificent and I couldn't wait for the 2000 Guinness to come along and he gave me the pleasure of making sure El Gran Senor showed just how good he was in the 2000 Guinness because uh, those two came away from what was a truly vintage field, one of the great Guinness. It is, and when you watch it back, El Gran Senor, Lear fan, Rainbow Quest, of course, this fellow chief singer, I think Jeff Smith, uh, of course, the owner of of Chief Singer on the day said of El Gran Senor and Pat Edry, he said that the horse, that horse on the day, El Gran Senor was unbeatable. He said he'd never seen a horse kick twice to go and do what he did. Uh, but in the form of Chief Singer, there was one hell of a horse just in behind him. Yeah, best minor I think I've seen before Frankly, That's what I would have him anyway. El Gran Senor, he was, he was brilliant. This and these are a tremendous you know, this was my race really, on this channel so many times it was my chosen favourite of a race so you know you've got Lear Fan in third who was a um, joint favourite for the race multiple group one winner one one the, the Jacques de Moire next time out Rainbow Quest who's struggling in fourth wins and art Keen was unbeaten going into it you had the, the Greenham winner tailed in behind and you know these two horses treated them like they were ordinary they were they were they were this is fantastic form, whatever way you look at it. And uh, Chief Singer rather boosted the form himself. Do you know what I love about it? Is, is not just the fact that he wins the Coventry on debut, but after that, they won the St James's Palace, which was back then a Group 2, smashed uh, the opponents in that. They wanted a Group 1. He destroys the best milers or beats the best, mi um, best sprinters, I should say, in the July Cup. But a month and a half later, after a July Cup win, he's, he's running in the Benson and Hedges, now the Judmont International, over a mile and a quarter. Yeah, that's why he was why he was so great. I mean, he was brilliant at Ascot when he won the St James's Palace, beat the track record one by eight lengths. Uh, absolutely awesome that day. And not many people expect him to drop down to six furlongs next time out. And it was beating committed and never so bold. And people of my vintage will know how good they were. You know, mm. they won Group Ones at York and uh, uh, the Pre de Labbe at, um, um, at Longchamp. The hot favourite that day was Habib, who didn't run a race. I'm not using her. But it was a very good July Cup, and he was good enough to beat them. And then he goes back to a mile and wins the Sussex States, and then he goes on uh, to run in the ten and a half furlongs at uh, York. Amazing. Yeah, that's why I liked him so much. I didn't mind him getting beaten. And he did get beat a few times. He could pull hard and uh, a few things. You know, he had a few setbacks on the way. But he was a magnificent-looking horse, and he, he featured in a great Guineas. And as I say, he was trained in such a... Um, ambitious way and he was from a, a yard which wasn't as well known he was Ron Sheather trained him a young Ray Cochran rode him so he wasn't from the the usual suspects if you know what I mean that was Chief Singer who was one of the star acts of the 1984 flat scene but the next horse that we're going to be taking a look at is undoubtedly uh, to the guest today Steve Mellish one of the uh, most significant going and it was Comanche Run we'll find out why inside the three furlong pole Comanche run from Golden Ivory with Shernazar still improving Lester looks over his left shoulder sees the dangers coming from Shernazar but it's Comanche run from Shernazar and Golden Ivory and racing down towards the furlong pole and Comanche run has gone a long way clear now of Shernazar Comanche run from Shernazar and Golden Ivory as they race up towards the nine. It's another for Lester Pickett, this one. Comanche run, well cleared of Shernazar in second and Golden Ivory third. And the result, first Comanche run, second Shernazar and third Golden Ivory. Fourth was Rami, fifth was Tellius, and six, seven and eight all in a row was Sam M, Young Turk and the very disappointing. Comanche run winning the Gordon Stakes.
uh, back in 1984. Now, many people who know you, Steve, um, and many people who don't know you will know why this is such a significant race to you and your life and everything that's come since then. Indeed, you were on record quite recently on a video interview talking about it. But to anyone who doesn't know, why was that race and that horse so special? Well, it, 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 there's two parts. It's, it's the part up to that race and why that race, I think, changed things and then what happened subsequently. Very briefly, because people have heard this so many times before, but I, I love the horse of the two. I saw it get, come second on his second run as a two-year-old. He, he, he looked a bag of bones that day, but he ran a great race. And he was just started the year with the horse I was most interested in following. Uh, Luca Cavani trained him. He still obviously started the year in Maiden. Started him in the Dante, which was unusual. Got well beaten, but again, showed something again, I thought. Then went set up to a Maiden at Doncaster and hacked up by seven length from a horse. You just saw this, sure as are. It's a pretty good Maiden. But anyway, he won really, really well. And I'd have backed him anywhere at that stage over a mile and a half. I'd have backed him in the Derby if he'd been running. I thought he was a really, really good horse. And things went wrong. This is the reason why that race is so different. For the next two runs, he went to Newmarket. Uh, it was a Royal Ascot and Newmarket, and they were identical stories. They were steadily run races. He was given, I thought, really, I know Luca would disagree with me, but really ordinary uh, rides, sort or of nothing rides, just hoping something would happen. Didn't really make much use of him. And he finished a one pace third at Ascot. And I, kind of, I couldn't believe he got beat that day. And I couldn't believe he got beat again at Newmarket, doing exactly the same thing. And that race you just saw was almost last chance saloon in terms of is he going to be a good horse and the significant thing for me and it it definitely made a difference is that Darren McHarg who was uh, obviously a very good jockey but he wasn't Leicester Pigger and he was suspended for Goodwood. Leicester got him the first time and low. The horse was ridden more pro more prominently. He hit the front three out. I was there with my brother actually that day who fell in love with him as well and uh, we've never embarrassed ourselves so much cheering from a mile out. The second he hit the front he was going to win and he had been crying out for some more positivity and uh, so that was that and the reason he came alive, I mean, you know, this is a dull story for people who have heard it so often. I was, you know, I told you there were loads of part-time jobs and just trying to, um, you know, make a living in the summer. It came to a point, we wanted to have children, myself and wife and uh, we had to, I had to make a decision so I, I needed to get more money uh, than I had if I was going to give it a proper go punting and joint decision, you know, we decided that uh, the ledger was going to be the day and uh, I backed it anti-post all the time, every time I got a price and uh, um, whatever money I had left so that I hadn't filled my account and my friend's account, I had on the day at, um, at Doncaster. And it didn't go without its hiccups, because again, up until then, Darren McHarg was going to ride it again. About five days or so before the race, it was announced that Leicester, at the owner's behest, was going to ride him. And on the same day, it was announced that he'd had an injury. He'd, um, he'd, he'd, he'd banged a knee in some way. And I thought, oh, my God, it's all going to go wrong without even a run. Anyway, history shows he did run. I don't think he was near his best of the ledger. I don't think he was anything like. Sure as I've only got beat two lengths that day. But he won. God love him. And uh, I certainly wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now without him. So it's vindication for the faith, but also what you put behind it. Because obviously it was a, a huge, huge financial investment. Um, did it take a bit of soul searching to want to do it or not? No, I mean, I, I didn't do anything. I mean, you know, really, it's a, it's, it's probably a stupid thing to do. It was just, um, um, it, it just come to a point where things had to change one way or another. You couldn't carry on, you know, doing rubbish jobs in the winter and and um, getting a bit in the summer. You know, I was doing okay, mm. but not enough to uh, support a family. So it, it was the decision was made for us, and you know, but for a, a head or a neck or whatever you want on the ledger day you know, things would have been very, very different. So I'm extremely fortunate. And, uh, um, you know, whether Daryl McHarg would have won the ledger, maybe he would, you know, who knows. But I know I felt mighty relieved that um, Leicester was on it. And the race at Goodwood, that's the race I wanted to see, because that's what changed everything. That's when he proved uh, what a good horse he was. They were good horses he was beaten, and he absolutely thrashed them. And obviously the following year as a four-year-old was a revelation. At the end of his three-year-old career, he went down as an average uh, um, classic winner, typical horse who was going to be campaigned over a trip too short the next year. Everyone thought he wouldn't be fast enough for a mile and a half. He was a two-miler, and they wasted their time, because that's what people did in those days. They wanted to try and get some stud value. But he transformed. The following year, he only ran at a mile and a quarter, and he was brilliant. You know, absolutely brilliant. He, he won a Jub Monty, which I think we're going to see, and he won the Irish Champion Stakes, and he was absolutely a brilliant uh, four-year-old over a trip much shorter. He was a class out, the St Ledger winner at three, won a couple of Group 1s over ten furlongs later in his career. So for a horse that, that wasn't able to win before, or certainly wasn't able to win as a three-year-old before, 
Uh, that Gordon Stakes, I think he'd won at Doncaster, admittedly. Uh, there was an absolute champion in there. Um, so this is three and a half decades ago now, 1985 all the way through till 2020. This was the, the horse that effectively enabled you to go and choose the, the plan in life, the path in life that you have done. There would have been ups and downs since, of course, but presumably when you look back, it's real vindication for, for the decision you made. No, I just avoided proper work. So, so this, just briefly, the race that we're seeing, just seeing at the moment, where well, it is much more important than, than, than me, just, you know, that's Osho Sharp, he's beaten in second place and tripped yeah. it in third. That's how good he was. You know, Osho Sharp's a, the Triple Crown winner, who had about fours on or something this day, and Leicester rode a sublime race in front and beat him. Say so with Tripcic, who won the race either the following year or the year after that. I think Palace Music was in the race as well, who won the Champion States. That's how good he was, and how he ever got beat at Royal, at Royal Ascot and Newmarket. Mm. Only me and only God and Daryl Hogg will ever know. And we talked about Henry Daryl Cecil, Hogg. right to talk about the trainer. Luca Kamani is always a trainer that you had, who, who retired, of course, at the end of 2018, a trainer that you had in the highest, highest regard. Yeah, it, 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 it's probably a tough thing. I did. I loved him as a trainer. Backed lots of his horses, and uh, I, 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 in a sense, found him, if you like, mm. through Comanche. I love the way he placed horses. There was some thought went into it. He wasn't really interested in two-year-old uh, runners. They were all looked late developing horses who got better with time and experience. He did brilliant in the big handicaps. So I think the saddest thing that happened to him. Um, I'm pretty sure he might have been champion trainer without it. He, 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 he had the Arga Khan's horses when he won the Derby on KRC, and he was made to train for the Aga Khan because they were late maturing types who got better. They had a, a falling out. I think there was a, a horse was, was uh, found with a banned substance in one of the Aga Khan horses, if I remember rightly. And he was training for Sheikh Mohammed at that stage and then Godolphin started. So a lot of things went wrong. But he still end, ended his career with a fantastic record all around the world. And he was an intelligent trainer. He thought about yeah. things. And uh, um, I can't say that I know him particularly well or ever knew him particularly well, but I, I admired him immensely as a trainer. Now, interestingly enough, when we get to the last couple, they're, they're this side of the millennium, but the first five that you've picked from Troy in 79 until where we are with Comanche Run 84, 85, just in a, a condensed sort of period of time, five or six years or so, but we had a chat the other day when talking about this programme and you said it, it was almost presumably a time when you wanted to absorb everything. This was such a significant time for you. Yeah, I believe that's the same with a lot of people. I yeah. think you are influenced. You know, if you ask people their favourite footballer, you, you'll find most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, it, it comes probably between your 20s and 30s where you're influenced. So, you know, uh, I'll have Madonna, Madonna and, um, and Pele over Messi or whatever. I don't, I don't know that literally, but I just think that's how things are, really. And uh, so, yeah, that was a, a, the era where I was... Um, absorbed by racing and uh, they, so some of my favourites did come there. But I also think, and that's why I try to be in their own right, I think every one of those deserves their place. Absolutely. We are going to switch to the last two. They are uh, this millennium and we're going to be looking at one of the great jumpers of this millennium so far, the mighty Denman. Ah, Denman's got him at it as they run downhill. So it's Denman who leads from Neptune Collange. Corto Star in third, Exotic Dancer is in fourth place as Denman is over the next from Neptune Collange. Again, Corto Star rushed his way through the top and Ruby Walsh draws the whip on Corto Star. Denman powering on down the hill, leads by three to four from Neptune Collange. Corto Star with a mountain to climb to retain his crown. Denman gallops on towards the next. He's over about eight clear. Net Neptune Collange, Corto Star, Exotic Dancer took it by the roots. They're now on the home turn, and Denman is 10 lengths clear from in second, ridden along Neptune Collange. Corto Star trying to stay on to second, but see the crown slipping from his grasp. It's Denman facing the Cheltenham Hill, but with a big lead. It's as much as 10 to 12 lengths, and Corto Star is struggling to even get past Neptune Collange. The second last. Denman comes to it, 10 lengths clear, and he's over. Corto Star's moved through into second. Then in third is Neptune Collange. The whip's drawn on Denman. Corto Star's staying on. Eight lengths between the pair at the last. Denman comes to the final fence. He's over from Corto Star in second, who brushes through the top. Denman is a tired horse. He has 200 yards to travel. Corto Star with eight lengths to find. But Denman and Sam Thomas, driven out, relentless, remorseless, has pounded Corto Star into submission. The answer is Denman. Denman won the Gold Cup from Corto Star, who shares a photo for second with Neptune Collange. How Congenelade was fourth in fifth exotic dancer and nowhere was sick. 
Denman, who won the Gold Cup in 2008, called home brilliantly there by Richard Hoyles, who'll actually be a guest on this show in a couple of days' time. But uh, he was your selection, Denman, the winner of the Gold Cup, of course, a couple of Hennessy Gold Cups as well. Why did you love Denman so much? Two reasons, but again, it's, it's partly what he what uh, what he represents as well. I loved him as a horse, first of all. I love the, his style of racing, the attacking, aggressive style, come and catch me, really great jumper, you know, genuine as they come, thorough galloper, absolutely lovely. That was a great Gold Cup as well, built up to be a significant race. I'm not sure Corto Star is best. I'm not sure that Corto Star wasn't the better horse, if you're being completely honest. But that day, he was magnificent. What I really like about him, most of all, is that he won two Henry and he's a bit of a throwback in many ways. Mm. The, the trend had been, and probably still is, for horses to be, the top horses to be campaigned in, in grade one races and uh, maybe quite sparingly. And, but you know, I, I told you I used to read a lot. I used to read about Arkle giving 15 stone away to a Gold Cup horse in second or whatever mm. it was. You know, all these horses carrying massive weights. And I remember Devon Orchid doing, you know, winning the Irish National, winning the wet bread, giving weight away. I love the horse that. He could easily have made the list for the same reason. And his second win uh, in the Hennessy, where he was off a mark of 174, giving £22 for a horse who won the Lexus yeah. uh, a little while later and was fourth in the Gold Cup. I, I love that. I love the fact that he was, say, he reminded me of horses of, of, the, of yore. You know, he, 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 he gave, he, he would, he'd given a chance uh, to try and give way to the beating to horses. And I, I think jump racing's history is full of horses like that. And this came... It's obviously been talked about so many times, written about, talked about, but this came after his much chronicled heart issue as well, which just added to the story, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he, and I'm not sure he was ever quite as good as he was on that Gold Cup day and then. He had a fibrillating heart. He won races, clearly, and he, he, he ran well in a couple of other Gold Cups. Uh, but, yeah, he was a horse who had his problems. And uh, the Hennessy, in some ways, was his last hurrah, if you like, the, the, two, the, the second Hennessy. The last hurrah as a, maybe as a really great horse. And as I say, he won't go down in, in history as the best chaser we've ever seen. He'll go down as a really good one. But I think he represented or he did more for racing than that. You know, he... He, 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 he went a different path, and a path I, I really admired. And as an, watching racing as you have over the decades, watching jump racing as you have over the decades, obviously Corto Star, there's Corto and Denman, the box neighbours, they were box office together. Um, as an era, with those two, but throw in the likes of Big Bucks, Masterminded, Twist Magic, Neptune Collange, that era of jumps horses at Ditchie, they were Galacticos, weren't they? Oh, phenomenal, phenomenal, and uh, they stand up to any era, you know. Um, I'm probably more fond of hurdles than I am of chase, if I'm being absolutely honest. Um, but Corto would be as good a chaser as I've seen live. He was an absolutely magnificent, uh, um, magnificent. His CV is, is ridiculous. And the other horses you mentioned before, yeah, it was a vintage, big bucks, wonderful staying hurdles. It was a, a vintage time, but uh, uh, Devon was just slightly different. As I say, he, uh, he's a different angle, and uh, God love him for that. Right, we'll get to the last one. Selection number seven, uh, and no guesses as to who this one is. The magnificent, unbeaten Frankel. Out the bushes, Frankel is 15 lengths clear. Frankel is heading down the water last quarter mile. He's making every yard of the running here. Dubarbi Gold and Native Khan have moved into second and third places. Parfork is behind him in third place. Into the dip. Frankel continues to be in front. He's six or seven lengths clear. To Dubarbi Gold is coming to second. Native Khan in third position. Inside the last furlong. A horse who is pure class. Frankel has destroyed them from halfway. An amazing performance as Frankel heads towards the Line to make every single yard in the Guinness and win it well. Jubari Gold in second, Native Khan in third, Slim Shady is just in fourth, and Fury in fifth. That magical sunny day back in 2011 when Frankel won the Guineas. Um, anybody, we don't need to be eagle-eyed to see what's over your left, left shoulder there, Steve. Uh, there's the, the, <laughs> the framed picture of Frankel. Was he very easy to put in the seven? Oh yeah, it's, I mean, you. One of the reasons we go racing is you want to see greatness. You want to see the best. So every time you turn up at a Newbury back end meeting or a Newmarket back end meeting for two year olds, you're hoping you're seeing a star. And I feel lucky enough. I mean, I can't prove it, but I feel lucky enough to see 
probably the best has ever been. Certainly the best of my life. And I loved Brigadier Gerard. He nearly made this list. I love Dancing Brave. You know, the great horses. I'm not in any way. See the stars, what a horse. <laughs> not in any way decrying them. But Frankel was as near, on a couple of occasions, in my opinion, as near to perfection he's got. The two... Two of his wins as a four-year-old when he won the Queen Anne by 11 lengths from Acceleration, yep. the Group 1 horse Acceleration, and when he won, first, stepped up to a mile and a quarter when he won the, the Jub Monty, again from Far and St Nicholas Abbey, multiple Group 1 horses, seven lengths without coming off the bridle. They were... They could not be beaten. Um, as was a side as well, I want to say one thing, because I think it's important. I think he was also lucky enough to have some great commentary for the races. So when you mm. watch races back, you hear them. We had Ian's commentary in the, in the 2000 Guineas area, Ian Bartlett, where you can almost see the amazement of what he was seeing. You know, that was won in such a weird, uh, an, a, a, a different style. And then you had Stuart's commentary when he won at, um, at York, where he just got the race perfect from start to finish, wherever Frankel was, what he was doing, and I uh, can't remember exactly. Exactly, was said King of the World or something at the end. It was so apt. And the final commentary, you, you said Richard's on Thursday. I still think it's the best commentary I've heard in a horse race. I, it may have been prepared, I don't know. But it ends, where he goes past Sirius to Zagolf with all comers, all ground, all beaten. Yeah. Now that about sums it up, really. 14 out of 14, and as near to perfection as I've ever seen in a horse race. In a race horse, I beg your pardon. And to span the career of Sir Henry Cecil, we've had our dross, of course, in the early 80s. This was in the early, early 2000s. How many times would you have actually been there, seen it live? How many times were you working for, for Racing UK for, for the Frankel days? Well, most of his runs. I didn't see him win at Doncaster as a two-year-old, but most of his runs I would have been there. And as I say, I, I was lucky enough to see him work and gallop on, I don't know, four or five occasions. So, yeah, so uh, the invest. And it was great. Uh, he came around, you know, he was a very sick man at the end. And, mm. uh, um, but he trained the horse. The horse had a, a little bit of a kink in him. Again, you see his final race where he doesn't really want to come out of the stalls. And I think he always knew that was around. And to... to take him through his career uh, in the way he did was a magnificent piece of training but he also was just as good about as good. well I just don't think you could see a better horse on the flat he was truly magnificent he was brilliant at two he was blitzing at three we got to see him at four which is something you don't always see with the top class classic horses and by the end of that four-year-old career we got to see him test himself over further you've already mentioned the Judmont International through the commentary of, of Stuart Machin but this was that August day and it was set against the the fact that Sir Henry Cecil who was very ill at the time as you, you rightly mentioned he was there he was present I think Frankel actually had a couple of security guards going around him in the paddock that was where we were with Frankel at at this point, this was perfect. Far was there, St Nicholas Abbey was there, quality horses to beat. And this performance is one that you never tire of seeing, really, do you? Uh, yeah, how, can you how can you beat this? He was perfection. He settled well, which he didn't always do in his early um, stages. At St Nicholas Abbey, the multiple Group 1 winner mm -hmm. next to him, also going really well. He thought, you know, what's going to happen here when they're let down? Well, you don't have to wait long. As I say, and Stuart was, was brilliant in the final film. The crowd was packed that day. It took ages to get there. The roads were, were, were really crowded. They all wanted him to win. He was a short price favourite, but it was a two very good horses he's beaten. And would he stay on the quarter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he would. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's hard, if you like horse racing, if you like horse racing, I do not see how this could be bettered. Mm. I think William Darby, of course, of, of the York Race Course, he always mentions the fact that nobody was in the bar, nobody was in any of the restaurants, they all wanted to be out there to get the vantage point and see Frankel doing what he did. And, and there was that inside shot uh, on one of the tracking jeeps where it almost looked like he was gliding over the Knavesmire that day. And this was at uh, the performance when he'd stepped up to 10 furlongs. But we would see him again, and that was, of course, in the champion stakes on Kipco British Champions Day, and it was the second edition of Champions Day, so significant uh, that the first two renewals of that meeting had Frankel there. He'd won the QE2 the year before, and of course this was his swan song. The ground was testing, the rock-hard French horse who'd won the race the year before, Cyrus de Zegler was there. There was a, a willy won't he, will he, will he, will he run or not? Um, and I think there was an announcement at Ascot that day Absolutely. saying he's passed to run. The ground was desperate. I mean, that's what, you know, I would really watch his race fearfully. Thought he'd be a bit serious as Abel's. He's an absolutely top class horse who's, you know, won the race himself. And now you knew, having missed the start, you knew he was going to win. And I say, 
when you hear the commentary, I think it's just brilliant. He, he gets the best. He had to be ridden this day to get the best. He wasn't, I don't think, at his best. And that's Nathaniel in third instead. He was not a bad horse. But I say, now, now you know he's won. And I say, Richard may or may not, you have to ask him whether he's written it, but I say, all comers, all ground, all beaten. Absolutely brilliant. Over coming on the show on Thursday. So, the best you've ever seen? And if so, by some way or not? Undoubtedly. No, no. You can't be some way better than Brigadier Gerard, and mm. you can give a very good argument that Brigadier Gerard was every bit as good. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to... Perfectly valid case, but in my opinion, best I've ever seen, yeah, absolutely. And put up um, consistently, incredibly high-class performances over and over again. We get that in sport, don't we? Whether it's comparing George Best to Cristiano Ronaldo or, or some of the golfers... Uh, to perhaps some of the golfers of years gone by to, to a Tiger Woods of now. Do you think, obviously we like to compare, but do you think sometimes it's just that little bit unfair to compare a horse from, say, the early 1970s to 40 years later? Look, it's just, it's just pub talk, yeah. You ask me <laughs> the best golfer in the world, but I'd say Jack Nicklaus, but I'd be always say Tiger Woods. Who knows? They're just, they're conversations, aren't they? They're not, they, they don't really, you don't prove anything. Of course you don't, but... Uh, um, people find them, you know, interesting to talk about, and that's 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 absolutely fine. Nothing wrong with that. Whether they, whether you, know, you don't, you can't prove anything by it. And if someone wants to say Brigadier Jean was better, well, fair enough. He was a great horse. Have you enjoyed this? Looking back over the over the near hour or so that we've looked back at, at seven of your finest racing memories. I've looked forward to seeing, seeing the races again. I haven't seen the uh, Gordon Stakes since 1984. Really? And it was good to be reminded of what was a, you know, a really enjoyable day. You know, I know there were other days more significant in terms of financially, but that was a, a day I will be one of my, you know, my favourite races, definitely. A little technological issue there, I think, going on. But uh, in terms of when this is all over, because as I said, we're doing these kind of programmes because we have no live racing at the moment, Steve. And I, no doubt you'll be chomping at the bit to get back racing again. And, and hopefully we do so when the weather's fine and we can all enjoy it again. But what will be the first thing you do when you get out of this lockdown? What do you think you'll be first up to do? I oh, like lots of people. Um, I haven't seen two of my sons for, for a while. Really looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, seeing some good friends and uh, catching up with them. I am so looking forward to going to a pub and having a beer with, you know, some people whose company I really like. So yeah, all of that. I've, everyone's in the same boat. It's uh, it's you know it's that's something to look forward to, and it will it'll happen eventually. It will, won't it? Um, and as this as this this period of of downtime from racing. Um, in terms of how you've been filling your time, have, have you have you been looking back at older races and, and got yourself a little bit nostalgic or not? I, I did for this. And fun, fun enough, of all the things you asked me to do uh, that I enjoyed most, we, we, I was asked to name my favourite jockey, which won't surprise anybody. Yeah. But it was fantastic watching a couple of old races. I think we're going to see one yeah. uh, in a minute. And uh, I haven't seen that for a very, very long time. Uh, so I found that really enjoyable, watching some old tapes and reminding myself that I wasn't talking, you know, complete rubbish about what I was seeing. Well, you've teed it up really nicely. I think anyone would have seen that um, a couple of the, the horses that you've seen have involved a, a certain rider, of course, Lester Piggott, the brilliant Lester Piggott on Comanche Run. We saw him in the Gordon Stakes. Uh, Lester Piggott, who won nine derbies, no less, at Epsom. And I think we're going to see the sixth of them back in 1972. This was Roberto. Of, of the nine, and I think we had plenty of footage going back, Steve, why was it this one that you picked out? Uh, of all the derbies I've ever seen, television or, or, or live, no, obviously the horse wins the race and that's the most important thing I think this is an example of where the jockey made that little bit of difference the second Rheingold is every bit as good as horses reverse it's not yep. like the Minstrel and Hot Grove where Willie Carson probably gave Hot Grove every bit as good a ride he was on the inferior horse Rheingold wasn't the inferior horse Lest, Lester got on it and won the arc Roberto it, you know, he couldn't do this now this was a really thoughtful ride which uh, whenever people talk about Piggott they go on about how thoughtful he was he was a magnificent jockey uh, when he had to not use the whip as well. By this day, he did. Nobody else at the time would have won in that day. Nobody else. It was absolutely the difference between winning and losing. And I think, what, how do you judge who's the best, who's not? I mean, it's really difficult. Yeah. I think he had the ability in the races that really mattered to think and act 
incredibly calmly. He had all the facets of a jockey. I'd say he was very strong, but he's also a beautiful jockey. I, 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 if anyone can get a watch YouTube, get the 1968 ledger out and watch him win on Ribeiro, a horse you couldn't touch with a whip, and see him win on that. If there'd been no whip, he would have been. He would have won more races. He was a brilliant jockey. I was trying to think who would be you know the best since, which is mm. getting it up to date. And I thought for years I probably would have said Steve Cawthon, but actually I've changed my mind on that. I think the nearest there's been to uh, to Leicester, there's been people, there's been you know Kieran for five years was fantastic. I think Frankie's the nearest I've seen. I think he's again yep. the longevity and the ability to keep producing it on days that really matter. I think he would compare with most. But Leicester had everything you could see, and for. For 15 years, it's impossible to overstate how big a name he was in the sport. You know, everyone accepted he was the best, and he was. You know, he, he made a difference on so many occasions. But that race we just saw, I don't think any jockey in the stand uh, in the in the uh, riding at that time would have won the race. Steve, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're out of time on this, the first episode of My Racing Life. There will be plenty more to come in the series. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>